I, w I would like to emphasise that I strongly believe in freedom of speech. I don't have a problem somebody purporting a theory, writing, fiction, suggestions. So, how did Madeleine McCann die? There are many theories, but let me set out as I see it the three main alternatives. Alternative 1. Madeleine died as a result of an overdose or sedatives or other drugs, either cumulatively, over time or administered on that holiday. Alternative 2. Madeleine died in a freak accident either when the McCanns were present or when they were not present. If the death was an accident, there needs to be a reason for the cover-up. If the McCanns were not present, the accident could have been covered up to conceal the McCann's negligence. Or an autopsy might reveal previous ill treatment of Madeline, for example, the use of sedative drugs or physical or sexual abuse. Or because there was a mystery about her true parents, i.e. she was not the true daughter of both parents, or she was a surrogate, or was adopted. Alternative 3 is that Madeline was the subject of an unprovoked assault by either parent or possibly someone else that killed her. Whatever the cause of death, were the McCanns and their group of friends connected in some way with a high-level paedophile ring, and perhaps that is why her death was covered up. Were the McCanns able to call in favours? This, by the way, was the exact phrase used by Kate McCann's uncle, Brian Kennedy, who lived in the same village as the McCanns. According to a report in the Daily Mail, Brian Kennedy spoke of how the family were calling in some favours. Or was there some other secret which bound the McCanns and the Tapper Seven together? That will lead me on to discuss whether on that holiday Madeline could have been passed to a paedophile to abuse her and died during that encounter. I'm going to start by looking at the hypothesis that Madeline died by some sort of drugs overdose, maybe sedatives. There are a number of indications that this, at the very least, may be a factor. I've made heavy use of analysis of the subject by a former police superintendent known on the internet as Peter Mack. If you look at the accounts Kate McCann has given of her immediate reactions to Madeline being missing, she speaks of having yelled, hitting out at things, banging my fists on the railings, running from pillar to post, throwing open, hurtling out, started screaming, was hysterical, and so on. It is surprising then, if the twins really were there during these events, that they did not wake up. I wandered into the children's bedroom several times to check Sean and Emily. They were both lying there on their fronts in a kind of crouch, with their heads turned sideways and their knees tucked under their tummies. In spite of the noise and lights and general pandemonium, they hadn't stirred. They had always been sound sleepers, but this seemed unnatural. Scared for them too, I placed the palms of my hand on their backs to check for chest movement, basically for some sign of life. Had Madeline been given some kind of sedative to keep her quiet? Had the twins too? Fiona Payne, in her statement, claimed that Kate had put a finger under the children's noses to test for breathing. But what is absent is any sense of urgency, of rousing them to make sure they were alive and breathing. Is the account of the twins doubled up in a crouching position fabricated? Perhaps created to suggest that the abductor could have sedated them? It is stated that at some point, friends carried the still-sleeping twins to another apartment. There is no proof at all that the twins were even in the McCann's apartment that evening. 
The Portuguese police report of the 10th of September 2007 was clear in saying that the crime scene in the children's bedroom had been arranged. The police who spoke to Kate McCann on the 3rd of August said, She now presumes that they were under the effect of some sedative drug that a presumed abductor had administered to the three children in order to be able to abduct Madeline, a situation which Kate refers to being possible. In a TV programme in 2009, Gonchalo Amaral was asked, do you think the children were sedated? He answered, there is no doubt. Kate called a colleague of mine on or about the 10th of August to ask the PJ to check the twins for traces of sedation. Kate was apparently alone when she called, and a bit upset. But that same afternoon, Jerry called and cancelled the request. Up until that date, more than three months after Madeline was reported missing, the McCanns had not previously asked the police to carry out toxicology tests on the children. Then, Kate asks, but Jerry later the same day cancelled her request. Several weeks later though, the McCanns organised their own drug tests on the children, which took place on the 24th of September 2007. That was very nearly five months after Madeline's reported disappearance. It allowed enough time for most drug toxins to have long since been eliminated from their bodies. Moreover, it was someone from the government-backed, highly questionable control risks group who arranged to carry out the tests. The McCanns didn't initially volunteer the scientific results, but in the end, an Indian newspaper, Darje, established that a company called Trichotest had performed the analysis. Kate McCann stated in her book, all the hair samples produced negative results. While this didn't totally exclude the possibility that the children had been sedated, especially given the time that had elapsed, it meant nobody else, including the PJ and the media, could prove otherwise. Nobody else could prove otherwise. Hmm. The result eventually announced on the 20th of October that no scientific evidence of sedative drugs or other drugs was found was welcomed a few days later by Jerry McCann, who, once again, emphatically denied they had ever used sedatives. He told the son, It's ludicrous. These sorts of questions are nonsense, and we shouldn't be giving them the light of day. There is absolutely no suggestion that Madeline or the children were drugged. It's outrageous. But strangely, despite that finding, the McCanns and those around them kept on promoting the idea that all three children might have been sedated by the abductor. For example, on the 2nd of October, Susan Healy, Kate's mother, claimed that Madeline had been drugged by her abductor. Jerry McCann claimed on the 19th of November, the twins were still sleeping in their cots, so we tried to leave it as undisturbed as possible, and they slept very soundly until we moved them out of their cots into another apartment. Which does make you wonder if there was any substances used to keep them asleep. Diane Webster, the mother of one of the Tapas Seven, told Leicestershire Police in 2008, uh, the twins were still asleep in the cot, and I, with all the noise going on, I don't know how they slept through it, which makes me think there was, they must have been uh, drugged with something, uh, by the abductor. I think Madeline would have been drugged as well. Later, on the 10th of April 2008, Fiona Payne said, But the twins were okay. I mean, they were fine. They didn't, they were asleep. But at the time, it did seem weird. They didn't wake up. And again, that was quite strange. Even in the transfer and, and being handled by people that weren't their parents, they didn't wake up. Later still, October 2009, two former detectives employed by the McCanns, Dave Edgar and Arthur Cowley, told a newspaper that they were convinced the abductor went to the family's apartment on May the 3rd, 2007, fully prepared with sufficient drugs, probably chloroform, to knock out all three children. The fact that Sean and Amelie, just over two years old, failed to wake when the alarm was raised, nor even as they were taken to another apartment in the cold night air, has persuaded the detectives that they too must have been drugged. And in a serialisation by the Sun newspaper of Kate's book, we read that Kate McCann said the kidnapper who seized Madeline may also have drugged her other two children. As she launched a new appeal in the hunt for her missing girl today, she said she had to check that the twins, Sean and Emily, were still breathing because they did not wake as they began a frantic search for the missing three-year-old. We must ask 
why the McCanns kept on repeating the they were sedated mantra. And bear in mind that I believe the McCanns know there was no abduction. Both Kate McCann and her doctor friend Fiona Payne were both qualified anaesthetists. If so, surely they would be able to distinguish the difference between a child which was merely asleep and one that had been heavily sedated. Could the McCanns themselves have been sedating the children? Kate's father, Brian Healy, in a TV interview conceded that I think they may have used Calpol, like most mothers. In that evening, did you give to your kids something like Calpol to help them sleep? You know, we're not going to comment on anything, but, you know, there is absolutely no way we used any sedative drugs or anything like that. And, you know, we'll, we have cooperated fully with the police. We'll answer any queries, um, any tests that they want to do. On the date he was made a formal suspect, Jerry McCann stated, When we travelled to Portugal, we brought several medicines, namely Calpol, Nurofen for fevers and pains, both for adults and children. Losec for gastric problems he occasionally suffers from and an antihistamine called tofenadine for hay fever. I didn't give any of these medicines or any others to the children while on holiday in Portugal. The tofenadine was left unsecured in a low-level piece of furniture in the parents' bedroom. It had the US brand name Seldane on the packet. It is a risky drug capable of producing dangerous heart issues such as heart arrhythmia and can be lethal if combined with grapefruit juice. It has been withdrawn from several countries. Some speculated that these had been given to Madeline or that she had got hold of some of these tablets herself, mistaking them for sweets. How should we interpret all this? We have a family member telling an interviewer that the McCanns may have used Calpol, yet Jerry McCann unconvincingly denies this. Then we have efforts to accuse an abductor of sedating all three children. A syringe lying close to some tranquilizers and surgical gloves was found in the villa where the McCanns stayed after leaving apartment 5A. A Portuguese police report reads, were the children sedated? Kate McCann via the Portuguese police inspector who acted as liaison officer for the family asked on the 10th of August why samples weren't taken from the twins in order to test the hypothesis that they had been sedated. She knew well enough at that time, more than three months later, that such an examination would be worthless. However, she went further and said that we, the investigation, should verify that the abductor had sedated Madeline in order to accomplish his action and that he had also sedated the twins as to be able to abduct them as well. But she didn't bring up these things at the appropriate time. What we know for certain is that the sedatives have periods in which to act as a sedative and timings at which they are normally completely expelled from the body that vary between 6 and 200 hours. The McCann's medical knowledge is enough to know this. I suggest that the McCanns did at least use Calpol and possibly other sedatives. Madeline, we are told in many reports, was a very lively child. Therefore, is it possible that Madeline was given an excessive dose of something, say on the Sunday night, and died later? A number of other possibilities have been suggested to account for the McCanns' persistent angst about sedatives in this case. One is the suggestion that the McCanns and their doctor friends on that holiday might have been carrying out covert medical research on some new sedative drug, or that the McCanns had some connection with one or more major pharmaceutical company. Another suggestion is that Madeline might have died from a Ritalin overdose. Jerry McCann's elder brother, John McCann, worked for major pharmaceutical firm AstraZeneca. In the days after Madeline was reported missing, acting as a family spokesman, he announced that AstraZeneca had given him indefinite leave from his job. This seemed rather drastic, but at that time there was still presumably hope that Madeline could be found alive any day. The Times on the 22nd of May 2007 reported, Gordon Brown has pledged his support. Last Friday, John McCann was dining with his friends when Downing Street called to say that the Chancellor was on the line. Minutes later, Mr McCann's mobile, on which he takes hundreds of calls daily, ran out of power, 
cutting off Britain's next Prime Minister in mid-sentence. Yesterday morning, as Mr McCann was talking to the Times, his mobile rang again. It was Revenue and Customs calling at Mr Brown's request to discuss how the fund could gain charitable status. The campaign has two nerve centres, one in Praia de Luz, the other is the Glasgow sitting room of John McCann, 48, who is on indefinite leave from his job as a medical rep for the pharmaceutical company AstraZeneca. There he fields endless emails and telephone calls. Various medicines were found in the villa the McCanns were staying in from July to September 2007. The issue of drugs and sedatives continued to be raised and caused an angry reaction from Kate McCann in 2012, five years later. The Daily Express reported Kate McCann's angry attack on alleged lies in a Spanish TV documentary on the case over drugs that were found in their holiday apartment and later in the villa they moved to in July 2007. The drugs found in the villa, she said, were simply drugs for Parkinson's disease, which her father Brian Healy suffered from. As for Ritalin, one viewer who has seen my films asked if Madeline could have died from a Ritalin overdose. Ritalin is frequently prescribed by doctors for the condition known as ADD or ADHD for hyperactive children. This viewer gave me some alarming statistics on how many children are routinely prescribed this drug and about the vast profits made by its manufacturers. I've looked up some references to Ritalin and there have certainly been a worrying number of child deaths caused by Ritalin numbered in the hundreds if not thousands and there is allegedly evidence that coroners have colluded in minimising the number of child deaths attributed to Ritalin. But the problem is we do not have a body. The toxicology checks on the twins didn't take place for nearly five months and so were worthless. Whether sedation played at least a part in Madeline's death can't be established but can by no means be ruled out. I now come to the freak accident theory which was the one advanced by Gonzalo Amaral and the PJ inspector Tavares de Almeida, who wrote a report on the case on the 10th of September 2007, three days after the McCanns were declared suspects. He concluded, the minor, Madeleine McCann, died in apartment 5A at the Ocean Club Resort in Praia de Luz on the night of the 3rd of May 2007. At this moment, there seems to be no strong indication that the child's death was other than the result of a tragic accident. Now, there is evidence that Madeline's death could be associated with loss of blood. We know that the smell of corpse odour was found in 12 places associated with the McCann's, in the apartment, in the car, on Kate's clothes, etc. Blood or body fluids were found in five of those locations. I appreciate that the second round of forensic tests conducted by the Forensic Science Service were inconclusive, allegedly because of contamination and that the blood and body fluids only might be Madeleine's. We know the first set of results seem to be a clear indication that the body fluids were from Madeleine, albeit from low copy DNA, but that result was superseded by the Forensic Science Service report. I want to focus on the very strong alert that the dogs gave to the area below the window in the McCann's apartment lounge. The cadaver dog, Eddie, gave a major immediate alert here. The blood dog found blood or body fluids in the exact same spot. In fact, there was a sufficient quantity of body fluids for one of the tiles in the corner to be lifted, where more body fluids were found. There is every possibility that, during a period between Madeline's death occurring and an abduction being announced, the apartment had been thoroughly cleaned. So if there was an accident, this looks like the spot where it might have happened. For that reason, a common suggestion is that Madeline might have fallen off the sofa and banged her head so hard that she died from her injuries. It was a hard tiled surface. However, I consider the possibility of a fatal accident occurring from such an accidental fall to be unlikely. Let us assume first that it happened whilst the McCanns were in the apartment. Accidents do happen and may sometimes be fatal. 
If it was such an unfortunate accident, why would they not inform the hospital straight away, even if she had died? It is a crime to conceal a body. An explanation that she had been playing around and banged her head on the floor would probably be accepted, unless, that is, her injuries were not consistent just with an accident. However, the position would be rather different if, say, Madeline and the twins had been left on their own in the evening. The accident happened soon after they left and they had not got back until the early hours of the morning. If this was the case, rigor mortis might have set in and therefore the hospital and the police might ask them searching questions about why it took them so long to find that Madeline was dead. In that scenario, the presumption of a significant degree of negligence would arise, with prosecution being a real risk. So that might have made the McCanns decide to attempt to cover up. There is a third possibility, namely that there was indeed an accident, but that if Madeline's body was presented for an autopsy, the authorities would discover something that the McCanns would desperately want hidden. The following suggestions have been made. There might be pre-existing signs of physical abuse, there might be pre-existing signs of sexual abuse. A toxicology report might reveal signs of past sedatives or other drugs in her system. Or her medical records or an analysis of her DNA might reveal something that the McCanns wanted hidden. The following suggestions within this have been put forward. That she was adopted or a surrogate child or was not the child of both parents or even that she was the product of some genetic engineering project perhaps a clone. On the subject of possible physical or sexual abuse, we have a range of photographs and videos of Madeline which the McCanns have put into the public domain. Generally, they show a happy, active, talkative child. Crucially, we also have three photographs of Madeline which, as I showed in my last Madeline film, were most possibly taken on the first day of the McCanns holiday, Saturday the 28th of April. These show a happy, lively young girl enjoying her holiday. Whilst signs of abuse are not always easy to spot, there is no real evidence of Madeline looking unhappy, poorly fed or unwell in any way. There is however one exception to that and that's this photo. The so-called makeup photo, which seems to have been taken near the end of her life, which I will come back to later. The third possible cause of death I suggested was the possibility of an unprovoked violent assault. A sudden loss of temper, perhaps by either of the parents or possibly by a third party. One reason for suggesting this is that such an event would create a much more powerful incentive for the McCanns to cover up Madeline's death. Her injuries might prove that violence or excessive force was used, more than would result from an accident. The body fluids, including blood, found under the living room tiles is another potential indicator that a violent death may have occurred, possibly Madeline being thrown against the wall or the floor, for example. In the bottom right of this picture, you can see where the removed floor tiles were. Also in this picture, you can see several spots, numbered up to 13 on the walls. Altogether, the Portuguese police located 16 spots in the living room where they were able to obtain a sample of DNA from body fluids. Ten of these, numbers 4 to 13, were on the walls, three on the floor, two on the back of the sofa and one elsewhere. Some have referred to the 15 spots on the wall, floor and back of the sofa as showing spatters of Madeline's blood. We cannot say that on the basis of the Portuguese analysis. One spot was matched with the DNA of a previous occupant, Sally Gordon. The Portuguese compared the swabs with 280 local residents whose DNA might conceivably have been deposited in the apartment, but there were no other matches. There was not enough DNA on most of the swabs to attempt to try and match the DNA with Madeline's. In any event, the spatters are so widespread that they would have resulted from a very violent blow, which would surely have left a lot more blood everywhere. So, despite claims by some that these might be blood spatters from Madeline, the evidence is simply not there. But that by no means excludes the possibility of a violent event having happened. Something we should look at, therefore, is whether there is any propensity for violence in either parent. Starting with Kate McCann, 
Here are some quotes from her own book on the night when she claims Madeleine was abducted. I was overwhelmed by fear, helplessness and frustration. I was hitting out at things, banging my fists on the metal railing of the veranda. The frustration and anger were reaching boiling point. I felt like a caged, demented animal. Finally I erupted. I began to scream, swear and lash out. I kicked an extra bed that had been brought into the apartment and smashed the end right off it. And here are three other quotes from later on in the holiday. My frustration with their lack of progress whipped up a storm of fury in me that was completely out of character. It seems to me now as if for several months I was possessed by some demonic alien that infiltrated my thoughts and filled me with anger and hatred. I needed a face on which to pin all this rage. My incredulity turned to rage. How dare they suggest I lie? My anger and ferocious maternal instinct began to permeate Jerry's despair. Keeping a lid on my anger, within seconds I was a raging lioness. I was incensed. My anger was bubbling below the surface. I felt such disdain, I found myself whispering, fucking tosser, fucking tosser. Later, Kate was to write of the Portuguese police detective Conchalo Amaral, he deserves to be miserable and feel fear. I wanted to inflict the maximum pain possible on him for heaping all this on us. Yet strangely, of the person who abducted her child, she was able to say, I can probably forgive Maddie's abductor, I don't want to be eaten up by hatred. We know newspaper headlines cannot usually be believed, especially in this case, but I've noted how many of them over the years have mentioned the McCann's fury, anger and rage. So it seems there is evidence that both Kate and possibly Jerry McCann might be capable of being temperamental, furious and angry. Another concern about Kate McCann was revealed early on when one of the McCann's relatives volunteered the surprising information which I have not yet verified, that there was always someone with Kate when Jerry was frequently away from home on holidays or on business. I believe it was a suggestion that she was possibly at risk to herself and others if on her own with the children, but as I said, I have not got this confirmed. The Portuguese police asked several questions concerning how Kate dealt with the children. What was Madeline's behaviour? Did Maddie suffer any disease or did she take any kind of medication? What was the relationship like between Madeline and her siblings, her friends and her colleagues at school? In England, did you give your children medication? What type of medication? Do your twin children have difficulty in falling asleep? Are they unruly and does this upset you? Is it true that at certain times you were desperate over your children's behaviour and that caused you to be upset? Is it true that in England you considered the possibility of handing over Madeline's guardianship to a relative? Kate refused to answer all of these questions, as she did with 40 other questions she was asked, exercising her legal right to silence. However Madeline died or was killed, it seems probable that her injuries or condition were serious enough to be covered up. The presence of a quantity of body fluids under the living room tiles that had to be removed would suggest that at least the possibility that a violent act may have been responsible for Madeline's death. That seems more likely to me than an accidental fall from a settee. Let us suppose for a moment that Madeline died either from an accident or from a violent act and that in either case the McCanns decided to cover it up. Most people would then ask, as many have done, why on earth would the Tapas 7 help them cover it up? True, they were all quite close friends, especially the McCanns and the Paynes. True, they were all doctors, apart from two of the wives. But would that be enough for them to tell lies and all agree to go along with an elaborate abduction hoax? A charade intended to deceive the police? I believe the evidence suggests that they did help the McCanns to cover up Madeline's death, as I showed in my first Madeline film. So there must surely be more to it. And that brings me to the fourth option I want to consider. Namely, were the McCanns connected in any way with a paedophile ring? Or, even worse, was Madeline passed to a paedophile to be abused and died during an encounter with him?
no one can doubt that the possibility that Madeline had been abducted by a paedophile was raised right from the outset, not least by the McCanns themselves. It was on the very first night when the alarm about Madeline being missing was raised that the McCanns themselves first suggested that paedophiles snatched Madeline. The Portuguese police files contain hundreds of witness statements. One was Graham Mackenzie, and this is his account of events at about 11pm to midnight, an hour or two after the McCanns had reported Madeline missing. I approached the McCanns' apartment from the bushes at the rear of the apartment. I did not know it was the McCanns' apartment at the time. I was searching in the little gardens on the poolside of that block. I was in the end garden. I heard and saw Jerry McCann standing alone in the doorway at the rear of the apartment on the balcony stroke patio about three metres away, talking on his mobile. Dr McCann was looking over the swimming pool and did not see me. Dr McCann was absolutely distraught, his voice cracking with emotion, telling the person receiving the call that he feared she, Madeline McCann, had been taken by paedophiles and that there were paedophile gangs in the area and that they had abducted Madeline. I do not know who the person receiving the call was, but presume it was a family member or someone he was very close to due to the nature of his conversation. I was so shocked by this, having originally thought that she had just wandered off. I think we need to contemplate this statement from the perspective that Madeline was already dead and that Jerry McCann was fully aware of this. So it was Jerry McCann himself who was apparently telling people he feared Madeline had been taken by one or more paedophiles. He was the first off the blocks to offer up this word. The media instantly took up the theme, with many newspapers giving accounts of other snatches by paedophiles. But none of these very rare snatches by paedophiles remotely resembled the McCann's scenario. In the months that followed her claimed disappearance, the McCann team went on to make numerous references, counted in dozens, to the probability that Madeline had been abducted by paedophiles. So-called experts on child sexual abuse and paedophilia soon appeared in the press and on TV to pronounce on their theories on the case. I want to mention two of them. The late Ray Wire, founder of the Gracewell Clinic for Treating Sex Offenders, and Mark Williams Thomas, a former police officer, self-styled criminologist and TV pundit. You have evidence to back up stories like Teresa's, that this yes. is really happening? Well, we have that age of child six, five and four, giving information that ties up with Teresa. How do those children know? How do those children able to describe rituals, to talk about ceremonies, to talk about sacrificing animals? How do those children know? Nightmares, imagining it. You can't imagine those things. Less than one week after Madeline was reported missing, the Daily Telegraph published an article by Wire on the case. I have worked with men who have abducted and killed children. Often their capture has failed to save the child and has not come about through good police work. The planning needed to take the child cannot be overestimated. It was clear from the beginning in Portugal that we were dealing with an abduction and the need to think offender was essential. What was his motivation? How would he initiate contact and target the child? How would he control the environment to evade discovery? Portuguese police cannot ignore the UK's experience in such cases. In the early 90s, a British paedophile group filmed the sexual abuse of Portuguese boys. At one stage, the Americans were so concerned about the role of British paedophiles in Portugal that I was approached about the targeting of schools there. International cooperation should be part of police thinking. However, there is no culture of community policing in Portugal and they have laws that prevent the discussion of cases. This is clearly the wrong way around. The media are essential in passing coordinated and directed information to the community. In this case, speculation is rife Confused messages are likely to be given. The parents will be feeling guilty for leaving the children and even half an hour is a long time if a child wakes up and starts to cry immediately after one leaves the room. 
This could possibly lead to a woman on her own who has lost a child saying to herself wrongly that the parents did not care for this child and deciding to take the girl home. No paedophile, no conspiracy, just a lonely woman. The window of opportunity for the abductor means that the information given by the parents has to be very accurate. Police must help them to say exactly how long it was since they last saw their child. The parents need to know that if this was an offender who planned the abduction, then there is probably nothing they could have done. I once asked an abductor who had killed girls how we could stop him. He said, I suppose you would have to chain a child to the mother. But he added, no, that would not work. I would take both. The Times wrote, if Madeleine McCann was abducted by a paedophile, there is a chance that she is still alive and can be saved by sensitive policing. According to Ray Wire, a sexual crimes consultant. Lately, there have been more and more cases where there has been an element of planning and an attempt to keep the child alive. The police must avoid doing anything to make the kidnapper panic. If he believes that they are about to move in and catch him, he may become so alarmed that he kills the child to stop her being a witness. He continued, Portugal is known to attract British paedophiles. A ring of 20 Britons set up there around 1990, filming sex acts with local boys and sending the tapes to Belgium and the Netherlands. Some were later jailed in England. The case helped to persuade the British government to make it illegal for Britons to have sex with underage children abroad. I went to Lisbon and became involved in the aftermath of that investigation. There were still lots of connections and other things going on. There have always been British paedophiles operating in Portugal. It seems then that Wyatt had fairly recent knowledge of a ring of British expat paedophiles in Portugal. Months later, the McCanns had a day with the Wires at their home. This is how the people reported the story. Kate and Jerry played no part in the disappearance of their daughter Madeline, one of the world's top crime experts declared last night. Ray Wire, who has given cracker-style testimony to courts since the 1970s, said, It is absolutely impossible for them to have been involved. He insisted the grief-stricken parents were incapable of doing anything to harm their children. Wire, who's helped nail a string of monsters, including child killer Robert Black, said, I was with them for several hours, and I could not help but apply some of the practices I use when I'm carrying out assessments of suspects for police and the courts. I can state categorically there is no way they were involved in their daughter's murder or disappearance. They would be incapable of such an act. I have more than 30 years' experience in this field, and I'm used to people trying to hide dark secrets. There was no sign of any such deceit. It is absolutely impossible for them to have been involved. He said for three days, all they could see in their minds was Madeline lying dead. They were in complete agreement she'd been taken by a predator, abused and killed. They were certain they would never see her alive again. The image of her lying murdered hardly left them and they expected at any time to receive the news that her body had been found. The article was a great boost for the McCann's. Wire died just five months after those seven hours with the McCanns. Obituaries praised him. The Guardian summed him up as a trailblazing therapist with a unique approach to sex offenders, one of the world's leading experts on sexual crime. The Times was just as exuberant. He was renowned for his pioneering work with people who sexually abused children. But there was a much darker side to Ray Wire, which makes one ask, what his real connection was to the McCanns and why he praised them so much. After he started his Gracewell Clinic for sex offenders in 1988, it continually attracted controversy. He was known to have an obsession with witchcraft and the occult. He was much criticised for claiming that there was a major satanic child abuse ring in Nottingham. No evidence of it was found. Three years later, he repeated the same disastrous mistake in Scotland, where one commentator said, Perhaps the most disturbing of all is the evidence that the investigation team was influenced by Ray Wire, a former probation officer who describes himself as an independent sexual abuse consultant. Though the local authority refused to admit it, the investigators attended a special three-day training programme in October 1991 organised by Mr Wire's Gracewell Institute. Only after this did the allegations of satanic ritual abuse begin to flow. Almost unbelievably, 
Despite this second setback, Wyatt tried the same thing again in Wales three years later. Another bout of satanic abuse hysteria broke out after Wyatt was paid thousands of pounds to run a three-day conference on the subject. Three years later, Wyatt was at the centre of another controversy. Channel 4's The Devil Amongst Us allowed five paedophiles to speak about their perverted desires, with one, Paul, quoted as saying, I would love to come out and have an open relationship with a child where we did the same things as heterosexuals do with each other. Society needs to stop discriminating against paedophiles. One of Wire's major techniques for controlling the desires of sex offenders was what he called masturbation satiation. Offenders were required to watch pornographic films of an extreme nature as part of the therapy while masturbating for a minimum of an hour and a half to two hours. Wire claimed that if they masturbated frequently over a long period of time, they would reach saturation level and no longer be tempted to engage in criminal sexual acts. It is a claim that has never been verified, except by Wire himself, who said that none of those who underwent this treatment ever re-offended. Wire told probation officers that such treatment should be mandatory. Wire was into witchcraft and the occult, and after his death, his name appeared on the Elm Guest House list. Elm House in Barnes, West London, was used for years by politicians and celebrities for sex with boys, who were taken for that purpose from children's homes far and wide. The allegations have been investigated under Operation Fernbridge and are ongoing. The guest list, shown here, is document number 63 in a list of documents examined by the Metropolitan Police in what many people perceive as yet another series of establishment cover-ups of high-level paedophile rings. These scribbled notes were written down by Chris Foy while interviewing Carol Kasser, the ex-wife of the former owner of Elm House in 1992. The seventh name on the list is Dr Ray Wire, Gracewell Clinic. These are mostly the names of actual patrons of the guest house who were abusing young boys. For other names on the list, Wikipedia tells us prominent people who attended parties at Elm Guest House are alleged to have included Liberal MP Sir Cyril Smith, the Conservative MP Sir Nicholas Fairburn, the Soviet spy Anthony Blunt, the former British diplomat Sir Peter Heyman, and the Foreign Office barrister Colin Peters, who was later jailed in 1989 for being part of a network which abused over a hundred boys. According to The Independent, other alleged visitors to the guest house include a Sinn Féin politician, a Labour MP and several Conservative politicians. The Independent on Sunday reported that at least three men named in documents as visitors to the Elm guest house were later convicted of multiple sexual offences against children. To summarise then, Ray Wire was a creepy, witchcraft and sex-obsessed individual who was also a probable child abuser. Why did the McCanns want to spend a day with him and his wife? During the weeks that followed Madeline's disappearance, one person local to Pride de also offered the McCanns hospitality. That was Sir Clement Freud, grandson of Sigmund Freud and brother of Lucian Freud. He was also the father of Matthew Freud, whom I mentioned in my first Madeline film and who married Rupert Murdoch's daughter Elizabeth. In her book, Kate McCann says that at the beginning of July, she got this letter from Freud. Dear McCanns, I have a house in Pride de Luz, been ashamed of the intrusion to your lives by the media, and if you would care to come to lunch stroke dinner at any time before Wednesday next, do ring and let me know. I cook decent meals. Sincerely, Clement Freud. According to Kate McCann, they accepted the invitation, taking with them the twins, Kate's cousins Sandy and Trisha Cameron, and their PR agent Justine McGuinness, who was acting more or less as an assistant to their PR spokesman Clarence Mitchell. They went at midday, and Freud's first words to Kate were, Can I interest you in a strawberry vodka? She gratefully accepted, and then sat down to what she called a bloody marvellous lunch. The McCanns kept in touch with Sir Clement. On the 3rd of September, the McCanns learned that they might be made formal suspects. At 10pm that day, the McCanns went round to see him for comfort and support, where Kate this time was offered, quote, a giant glass of brandy. And as we all now know, 
on the 14th of June 2015, we saw these banner headlines. Sir Clement Freud exposed as a paedophile. Sir Clement Freud accused of abusing two girls. These allegations surfaced in ITV's documentary the next day. Exposure, abused and betrayed, a life sentence. The internet had for years carried gossip that he had abused more than just two children. By all accounts, his attack on these girls had been violent. His wife, Lady Freud, who must have known about her husband's conduct, publicly apologised for his behaviour. A few days later, the press announced that there was a long history of emails between the McCanns and Freud after the McCanns returned to England. More details then emerged about Freud, including the revelation that, when he was elected to Parliament as MP for Ely in 1973, he for many years shared his parliamentary office with the notorious Rochdale paedophile and fellow Liberal MP Sir Cyril Smith. So what is the significance of this? We have now met one certain paedophile, Clement Freud, and a witchcraft and sex-obsessed probable paedophile, Ray Wire. Both of these men have a connection with notorious paedophile Cyril Smith. Wire and Smith were apparently regulars at Elm House. In my first film, I exposed the huge influence of the security services in the Madeleine McCann case. I named MI5 Special Branch other branches of the security services and government funded security firms like Control Risks Group. There was a top secret command group set up on the 8th of May 2007 under the chairmanship of Matt Baggett, the head of Leicestershire Police. These agencies were in direct contact with the McCanns. I ask, given Ray Wires and Clement Freud's connection with Cyril Smith and possibly other paedophiles, how likely was it that government security services were fully aware of and monitoring all of them. I suggest it would be a certainty. In fact, these paedophiles must have been assets of the security services. The fact that the McCanns were not warned about these paedophiles adds weight to the assertion that they were assets of the security services and not merely being monitored by them. There has been an extremely close connection for 10 years now between the McCanns and the former head of the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Unit, CEOP, Jim Gamble. He has spoken regularly on the McCanns' behalf. This was despite the obvious fact that the McCanns had publicly confessed in two national newspapers on the 5th of August 2007 to having left three young children, all under the age of four, in a vulnerable situation on their own for significant periods of time, six nights in a row, and on their own evidence, clearly failed to protect them. Of course, watchers of my films know different by now, but Gamble says he believes the McCanns, and must also believe that they left their children alone for long enough to be abducted. Many questioned why an organisation with the words child protection in its title should feature the McCanns. Gamble, from Northern Ireland, got his first job in the Royal Ulster Constabulary, after which his rise was meteoric. An intelligence officer, during the Kinkora Boys Home child abuse scandal, he rapidly became the head of the RUC's anti-intelligence unit. After that, he became head of special branch for the Belfast region. At the end of my first Madeline film, I noted how the Kinkora Boys Home was used by MI5 who were supplying boys to prominent politicians, then filming the disgusting abuse on hidden cameras which they had installed. The films were then used to blackmail the politicians. What Gamble's role was at the time is not known. An article on Jim Gamble titled, Was Jim Gamble a corrupt police officer in Northern Ireland and did he authorise or cover up murders? A look at the findings of Operation Ballast by Baroness Noala O'Lone on the Northern Ireland Security Services deals specifically with the series of murders in the 1990s. It was devastating. Senior Special Branch officers murdered people, covered up murders and were thoroughly corrupt. The corruption and abuse was widespread, of epidemic proportions. Gamble had a senior position at this time. But fortunately for him and the others, they were never actually named in the report. So perhaps we will never know how deep his role was in these murky matters. 
From Northern Ireland, he became Deputy Chief Constable of the National Crime Squad, which later morphed into the serious organised crime agency Soccer. There he was given special responsibility for dealing with the problem of child sexual abuse, and in 1999 was asked to head up the controversial Operation Or. This operation was inspired by information received from the United States. The authorities there had gained access to the database of Landslide, a place where people could access child sexual images by paying a fee by credit card. Wikipedia claims there were 3,744 arrests and 1,451 convictions, but also noted that the validity of the police procedures was later questioned as errors in the investigation resulted in large numbers of false arrests. There were at least 33 suicides resulting from Operation Or. We've had as many people kill themselves as we have identified those that abuse children. When you go through the door and show people that you're executing a warrant under the Protection of Children Act 1978, you have just blown the biggest hole in somebody's life that could possibly ever happen. Until now, they thought that they were safe in their environment, downloading child abuse images on a computer. They thought that it was acceptable for them to download indecent images on their computer. And you've suddenly gone in and told them, actually, it's not. You're a paedophile. We ruin their lives. Criticism of it centred around whether or not the owners of credit cards in Landslide's database actually accessed any sites containing child porn, unlike the US, where investigators had to determine in advance whether or not credit card subscribers had actually purchased child porn. Investigative journalist Duncan Campbell exposed these flaws in a series of articles in 2005 and 2007. There were many reports that the list of those investigated by Operation Or included senior politicians, judges, celebrities and other VIPs, but none of these were prosecuted apart from Pete Townsend of The Who. And on the back of what was hailed as a success, the Blair government in 2006 appointed Jim Gamble the head of a brand new task force, the Child Exploitation and Online Protection Service, or CEOP. Jim Gamble was right on Madeline's case from day one. Within days, he interfered with the Portuguese police investigation by making a public appeal for people who had been in Praia de Luz around the time of the McCann's holiday to send him, and not the Portuguese police, their holiday photographs. He issued an email address which ensured that any images came direct to him. At this time, Leicestershire police were also involved in supposedly assisting the Portuguese police. So for what reason was SEOP, 2,000 miles away in London, involved in collecting these holiday photographs? Were they working with or against the Portuguese police? According to a source close to the investigation in the United Kingdom, several hundred photos were sent to the British authorities, most of them downloaded via internet pages specially created for the occasion. Jim Gamble stated, we will then evaluate these images at a rate of 1,000 images an hour, so that before long we are sending the significant information to the Portuguese authorities. But, did the Portuguese police ever get these images? No. Gonçalo Amaral wrote in his book, none of these images ever reached us. Along with Gamble, two other characters keep popping up who seem to move in the same circles. One is a former police officer turned criminologist and self-professed child abuse expert Mark Williams Thomas. The other is Dr Joe Sullivan, a psychologist. Soon after Madeline was reported missing, the press reported, Highly respected forensic psychologist Dr Joe Sullivan arrived in Pride de Luz within days of Madeline's disappearance as part of a so-called cracker team with Detective Chief Superintendent Graham Hill. He returned to the UK on the 9th of May 2007. He wasn't there for long then, but he had been specifically selected to go to Praia de Luz by the Foreign and Commonwealth Office and was one of Gamble's trusted aides, having worked alongside him at SEOP. I also mentioned Mark Williams Thomas. He was also quick off the mark to get to Praia de Luz. He was already making several strong and detailed criticisms of the Portuguese investigation even though he can have known little about what was really going on in the PJ offices in Portimao. 
Gamble, from 2007 onwards, heavily featured Madeline on the SEOP website and in various SEOP publications, regularly using photos of Madeline and the McCanns. Mark Williams Thomas continued to appear regularly on Sky News, pontificating about paedophiles and speculating about what might have happened to Madeline. On the 15th of September 2007, the Gazeta Digital website published an article by Duarte Levy and Paolo Reese about Mark Williams Thomas and his views on the Madeleine McCann case. After hearing him on Sky News, they wrote, Mark Williams Thomas urged Portuguese police to ditch the case against the McCanns, a case that he classified as ludicrous and follow another lead that he thinks could take the PJ to the real kidnapper. And this is what he described as the similar disappearance of an eight-year-old girl, Joanna Cipriano, two years earlier. This comment, which went unchallenged, was almost unbelievable. The truth of the matter is that Joanna Cipriano's mother, Leonor Cipriano, and her brother brutally murdered the little girl after she discovered them committing incest. Both later made full confessions, the one by her brother being detailed, graphic, and gruesome in the extreme. The person who led the successful investigation was Gonchalo Amaral. Both murderers were sentenced to 16 years and are still in jail today. It beggars belief that Williams Thomas could get away with such a monumental untruth in front of millions of viewers. A professed expert, he had successfully fed the abduction myth. But then it was the Murdoch-owned and controversial Sky News that was giving Williams Thomas the airtime. On the 14th of September 2007, Mark Williams Thomas was questioned by Paolo Reis about his business relationship with the McCanns. He then admitted that his company, WT Associates, had a contract to provide services to the McCanns. But when asked to confirm in writing some details of that business relationship, he changed his initial answer, denying any relationship and admitting only that he has been in contact with the press officers for the family. It looks to me then that Williams Thomas was probably not an independent commentator on this case. On the 5th of November 2009, SEOP, under Jim Gamble's direction, produced a one minute video called A Minute for Madeline. It was a SEOP production featuring an age progressed sketch of Madeline as she might be aged about six. And it was narrated by Gamble's friend, Dr. Joe Sullivan, also from Northern Ireland. According to the McCannFiles.com website, Sullivan helped in the production of and personally narrated the video and appealed directly to the person keeping a secret about Madeline, who knows who's involved in her disappearance and who may have been groomed by the perpetrators to stay quiet. At the time, ITN News reported that the criminal psychologist behind a new Madeline McCann appeal, Dr. Joe Sullivan, has told ITV News that her abductor is very likely to strike again. In October 2009, the McCanns had a private interview with Jim Gamble. Following that private interview, several press reports indicated that the then Labour Home Secretary, Alan Johnson, had asked Jim Gamble to recommend a new British police force to carry out a review and possibly a full investigation into Madeleine's disappearance. It was baffling why the Home Secretary, knowing Jim Gamble's extreme closeness to the McCanns, should choose him to recommend who should carry out an independent review into Madeline's alleged disappearance. These discussions continued when Theresa May became Home Secretary in 2010 and led to the setting up of the Met Police's Operation Grange investigation. But as I said earlier, this has never been a real investigation. It was a psyop from day one. It almost seemed as if Gamble was running the McCann case. Gamble was recommending what form any review of the Madeleine McCann case would take. There is little doubt that Gamble shaped the Operation Grange review, which, as I've shown in my films, ended up only considering an abduction theory about Madeleine, and has ended up being a £13 million total failure. In May 2010, a general election saw a change of personnel and Theresa May was made Home Secretary. She soon proposed that SEOP be brought back under the Serious Organised Crime Agency, now the National Crime Agency. Seeing it as a threat to his power, 
Gamble told May that he would resign his post as SEOP chief executive if she went ahead with her plans. This prompted the McCanns, supported by some of the media, to loudly praise and thank Gamble for his excellent work and condemn the Home Secretary for effectively scrapping SEOP as a separate organisation. A huge loss to child protection, they cried. Once again, this suggested a very close tie between the McCanns and Jim Gamble. Also, why were the McCanns so thankful to Gamble? After all, he hadn't found Madeline. I believe they were thanking him for protecting them from prosecution. But Theresa May did go ahead with her plans and swiftly accepted Gamble's resignation. Since then, he has formed a very profitable business, Inique, which sells expensive courses on child protection to social services and child protection staff. But despite his new career, Gamble continues to tweet about the Madeleine McCann case on Twitter, aggressively challenging anyone on Twitter who questions the abduction myth. One other fascinating claim was made in 2015 relating to Gamble. Two US Madeleine researchers using the Internet Archive website Wayback Machine to investigate the history of the SEOP website, said they had found a record of SEOP setting up a dummy page for Madeleine McCann on their website dated the 30th of April 2007. This is the day after I suspect Madeleine died and three days before she was reported missing. If this could be proved, it confirms my theory that Madeleine died on the Sunday, triggering a frantic effort assisted by government agencies to plan a hoax abduction four days later. But the owners of the website removed the entry, claiming the entry was invalid. In my opinion, this issue is still not settled. It is fundamentally a technical argument, and I myself, with much experience of internet programming, I'm not convinced by any of the explanations people have put forward as to why the entry was invalid. Let's just mention a few other paedophile connections to this case. I dealt with Robert Murat earlier and the allegations by two witnesses that he had attacked a young girl and had child sexual abuse images on his computer. He was unable to explain to the police why he had encrypted material on his computer. One of the Pridola's residents with whom Murat had business interests and whom he met up with between his early morning flight to Portugal and Madeleine's reported disappearance was a Russian expat, Sergei Malinka. Clearly, they were good friends and business associates. There were also allegations that he too had child abuse images on his computer, but it appears that he wiped his hard drive before the police could get to it. I will also mention Jane Tanner's interview by Leicestershire Police in April 2008. During a series of interviews, she made constant sexual innuendos, for example about the males in her group needing relief. She seems to have no idea that to constantly joke about sexual issues and use sexual innuendos in a police interview on a possible child abduction case was abnormal. These were not references to child sexual abuse, but they do suggest that the culture of the McCanns and their friends may have been fairly uninhibited on sexual issues. There is one other very important reason why this constant connection of the McCanns with the subject of paedophilia matters a great deal. And that's because of credible claims that both Jerry McCann and his good friend David Payne had a sexual interest in children. The allegation was especially credible because it was made by two general practitioners who had actually previously holidayed with the McCanns. Dr. Aral or Savio Gasper and his wife, Dr. Katharina Gasper. They were prompted, they said, by seeing the face of Dr. David Payne on television a few days after Madeline was reported missing. Because of what they remembered happened on their previous holiday with the McCanns and the Paynes, they instantly thought that Dr. Payne might be connected to Madeline's disappearance. They immediately contacted Leicestershire Police, who took formal statements from them. Dr. Katharina Gasper on the 16th of May said, I was sitting between Jerry McCann and David Payne, and I think both were talking about Madeline. I can't remember the conversation in its entirety, 
but they seemed to be discussing a particular scenario. I remember Dave saying to Jerry something about she, meaning Madeline, would do this. While he mentioned the word this, Dave was doing the action of sucking one of his fingers, pushing it in and out of his mouth, while with his other hand he was doing a circle around his nipple with a circular movement around his clothes. This was done in a provocative way. There seemed to be an explicit insinuation about what he was saying and doing. I remember being shocked by that. I always felt it was something very weird and that it was not something anyone should say or do. I looked at Jerry and also at Dave to gauge their reactions. I looked around as if saying, did someone else hear that or was it just me? The conversation stopped for a moment, then we all began conversing again. Moreover, I remember Dave doing the same thing on another occasion. During our holiday in Mallorca, each parent would bathe all the children in turn. I was keen to stay near the bathroom if Dave was bathing the children. I remember I said to Savio to be careful and to be close by if Dave was helping to bathe the children and my daughter in particular. Her husband, Dr. Arrol Gasper, said in his statement, During the period when we stayed at the villa, I remember a gesture made by David Payne. I do not remember the context of the conversation between David and Jerry, but I do remember seeing David use his left index finger to rub his nipple using circular movements, while he put his right index finger into his mouth, touching his tongue. I remember that when I saw this gesture, I immediately thought it to be in very bad taste, independently of the context of the conversation they were having. I don't know if anyone else saw the gesture, apart from my wife, Katharina. Inexplicably, Leicestershire Police held on to these statements for an unbelievable six months before faxing them over to the Portuguese police. I suggest this was no mistake either, because they were sent over to Portugal a couple of weeks after Gonçalo Amaral had been removed from his post. I have to ask why any genuine police force would refuse to pass on information like this, which clearly the two Gasper doctors fully intended to be investigated. It seems that Leicestershire Police, or the associated powers that be they were colluding with, didn't want Conchala Amaral to know that instead of the possibility of the alleged abductor being a paedophile, he might be dealing with at least two paedophiles within the group of doctors that were claiming Madeline had been abducted. Now I want to come on to another video about Madeleine McCann. This was produced by Madeleine's godfather, Liverpudlian filmmaker John Corner, who plays a role in events after the 3rd of May 2007. In August 2007 he spent a week in the McCann's villa filming a video which he then leaked to a BBC Panorama team who made a documentary in 2007 making use of Corner's footage. On the 1st of May 2010, just ahead of the third anniversary of Madeline's disappearance, Corner released a two and a half minute video which caused a storm of protest. What caused the protests were these three still images in the middle of the film. One press report explained, Parents of Madeline McCann who went missing three years ago have released a new video and photo of their missing daughter to mark the third anniversary of the girl's disappearance but the McCanns up till now had not in the previous three years ever displayed these three controversial photos. If it was explicitly approved by the McCanns, it was certainly a very strange decision. The first one has been called the floorboards photo. This one has been called the ice lolly photo. It was the middle one, however, which caused the greatest adverse reaction. It's been called the makeup photo, for obvious reasons featuring much blue eyeshadow, a pink hair bow, lipstick and jewellery. She does not look happy. Many call it the Lolita photo. Like the other two photos, it was clearly posed. The photographer must have been positioned well below her head, looking upwards at her. When the video was released, 
and an intense debate began about the choice of these three photos, the McCanns publicly claimed that the photo shows her when she was three after a raid on her mummy's dressing box. Could she have put the necklace on herself? Could she have applied the pink bow to her hair? Could she have applied the blue eyeshadow neatly? Or lipstick? Overwhelmingly, observers agree that the evidence from the photograph suggests that an adult made her up. And of course, an adult was on hand to take the photo. The McCanns have not said who took this photograph. Even if Madeline had raided the dressing box as claimed, it is one thing to take a photo like that for your family photo album, but it's an entirely different matter to release it for millions to see. The next day, many media noted that Madeline looked much older than her actual three years due to the makeup and jewellery. The independent newspaper said, Can the McCanns be thinking straight? To keep their story alive, they have just released a moody video complete with a musical soundtrack which includes a photograph of the three year old wearing makeup and gazing into the camera. It is that image which, predictably, has featured in the media. It seems a bizarre and unsettling development. Clearly, someone should surely have pointed out to them that, in a case over which paedophilia casts an obvious shadow, it looks downright weird when a photograph which has the effect of sexualising the missing child becomes part of the campaign to find her. Even Mark Williams Thomas, despite his unstinting support for the McCanns, was so shocked at the images that he went on his Twitter account stating that it was so inappropriate and so damaging. Another prominent commentator wrote, I know what a picture of a child playing looks like. My parents have albums of pictures of my sister as a child playing with makeup, dressing up. I also understand when I'm seeing the deliberate sexualization of a child. I also know which end of the spectrum that those images lie. I've previously criticised people for expressing these sorts of views, but when you see the three Madeline pictures in that video in close succession, you start asking, what's the probability that this is just some sort of accidental pose? I really don't like the answer. I'm not a photographer nor a filmmaker, nor actively involved in the media. And so if I can pick up on these references, then John Corner most certainly can. Newspapers were flooded with similar comments. Here's a selection. And there were hundreds more comments like this, all in the same vein. When I looked through the range of comments about the makeup photo, I found two, both of which I think are very perceptive. I'm looking at her hair. The fringe is kind of grown out and comes to beneath her eyes, just like the last photo, the one of Maddie by the pool with Jerry and Emily. If you look at pictures of her a few weeks before in Donegal, her fringe isn't that long. If it was taken before the holiday, it must have been just before, in my opinion. The second comment, also very observant. Still, I don't understand the purpose of the photo with the blue eyeshadow. Anybody notice that on this said photo, the right side of the background seems to show the same wall as the wall in the new released video? So was the photo taken while on holiday? Is the photo meant to remember somebody who was there when the photo was taken? I have compared the likenesses of Madeline on the makeup photo with her on the last photo and I think the similarities are striking. Here are my observations. Madeline's face appears to indicate that the pictures were taken around the same time. The length of her hair and fringe appears to be identical. In both photos she is seen wearing a pink hair bow or band. This is unusual as I can only find two other photos of Madeline out of many where she has a hairband. They may not be the same bow or band but clearly on both occasions an adult had been arranging her hair. On both photos Madeline can be seen wearing a pink top. Now in addition to these observations I note that in the makeup photo Madeline is photographed against a pale yellow ochre coloured stucco background of a type rarely seen in England, but very common in Mediterranean countries like Portugal. Moreover, to the right of Madeline's head is a dark coloured object which could be a lamp holder, which again looks similar to the layout of properties in the Ocean Club. Here is an example. The blue object looks as though it might be a blue plastic chair, as shown here. 
Now, in my previous film, When Madeline Died, you recall that I presented persuasive evidence that the so-called last photo must have been taken on the Sunday, the second day of the holiday, mainly because of the weather conditions. I also showed that there was no convincing evidence of any photos of Madeline being taken after that date. I suggest that the makeup photo was taken in Prior de Luz that very week. There is no evidence that any photos of Madeline exist after Sunday the 29th of April. So I suggest that the makeup photo was taken on the same day. Madeline, to most observers, looks unhappy in this photo. Madeline was also dressed up for the last photo. She has a pink smock on and she had a pink hair bow or bead. In the makeup photo, she also has a pink top, maybe the same one. She still has a hair bead or bow, maybe different, but now, additionally, she has a necklace, eyeshadow and lipstick. It's a possibility then that the makeup photo was taken in the afternoon sometime after the last photo by the pool. And as I suggested in my last film, I think the time Madeline died may have been within a few hours of that picture being taken. So is it possible then that the makeup photo is the true last photo of Madeline? I have covered the subject of paedophilia of child sexual abuse in some detail because as I hope I have shown, it does appear to be relevant in some way to the reported disappearance of Madeleine McCann. By that, I do not mean to accuse the McCanns or any of their Tapper 7 friends of being paedophiles. The only evidence of this, indirect evidence, comes from the statements of Dr. Arrell and Dr. Katharina Gasper, which I will leave for you to interpret. Nor do I suggest that Madeleine was killed at the hands of a paedophile, Though in this extraordinary case, I don't think anyone can rule it out. The makeup photo, possibly taken on Sunday, is disturbing. But is it possible that however Madeline died, by sedation, by accident or by a violent attack, that there is some kind of hidden connection that the McCanns or one of their friends have to some high-level paedophile ring? Let's not forget also that Peter Hyatt, an expert in statement analysis, concluded that there was a strong possibility of child sexual abuse in connection with this case. There is one more statement, and I hesitate to mention it because it is so graphic, but it is in Kate McCann's book. She describes how she imagined Madeline having been abused. I told him about the awful pictures that scrolled through my head of her body, her perfect little genitals torn apart. Admitting to the existence of these images somehow confirmed them as a real possibility. Now what was that doing in her book? On top of all these indications, there is one other obvious mystery that we must explain. And that is the astonishing way in which the government and the security services were all over the case from day one, and maybe even before if we count Robert Murat's dash to Pride de Luz three days before Madeline was reported missing. What else could possibly account for this, except the cover-up of a potential national scandal over high-level VIP abuse of young children? It can only have been something very big and very bad. If the McCanns were in any way, however loosely, connected to a high-level paedophile ring, that would certainly explain it. I want to briefly examine some other theories that have been put forward to explain this remarkable top-level involvement. These centre around firstly the true genetic origin of Madeline and secondly theories that the pharmaceutical industry was involved. Some people have suggested that most of the holiday makers were swingers on an adult holiday and that this was the reason for the cover-up it is said that none of the high-profile attendees wanted to admit they were swingers. Others simply point to the McCann's existing connections to the rich and powerful, such as Jerry McCann being on the committee of the nuclear energy quango, Comare, along with Gordon Brown's brother, Andrew Brown. One set of theories suggest Madeline may not have been the child of both parents. These theories have included, firstly, that Madeline was adopted, or secondly, that Madeline was a surrogate child, 
or thirdly, that Madeleine was the result of a sperm donation by a third party. Other theories relating to genetic origin suggest that Madeleine was the product of some kind of genetic experiment, maybe with her DNA having been partly genetically engineered, or that she was a clone. In other words, a secret intelligence genetics or eugenics research program. The McCanns have always insisted that they are the natural parents of all three children. All were conceived by IVF treatment. Madeline was born after IVF treatment in England and the twins after IVF treatment in Holland. One curiosity is that, so far as I'm aware, no photo of Kate being pregnant has ever been published. In her interviews in the early days, Kate said little about her pregnancy with Madeline, describing it as easy and problem-free. In her book, she writes, My pregnancy was totally without complications. No sickness, no back pain, no bleeding, no swelling. I felt great. And of Madeline's birth, she said, There she was, perfect. A specific allegation that Jerry McCann was not Madeline's father first surfaced in the Portuguese press in the paper 24 Horas in September 2007. The story claimed that senior sources of the Portuguese police believed that they knew who the sperm donor was and stated that he had been traced and had been in England on the 3rd of May, the day Madeleine was reported missing. The newspaper claimed that this had been confirmed by Portugal's National Institute for Forensic Medicine. A source claiming to be from the Portuguese police said, Jerry McCann was not the sperm donor for Maddie. He was the donor for the twins, but it's possible that Jerry himself doesn't know he's not the biological father. There may have been a switch at the laboratory. Another magazine, Tale Qual, repeated the allegation, causing Clarence Mitchell on Jerry McCann's behalf to issue a firm insistence that he was the true father of Madeline and to threaten to sue the magazine. Finally, was there a connection to the pharmaceutical industry? Theories that the pharmaceutical industry was involved put forward that Madeline, and maybe the twins as well, were being subject to a trial, authorised or unauthorised, of some new and potentially dangerous drug and that a pharmaceutical company may have leaned on Mark Warner and the government to cover up their testing of a drug that was being trialled, which caused Madeleine's death. All this appears to be speculation, though I have discovered that two doctors on that holiday with whom the McCanns were friendly, Dr Paul Weinberger and Julian Totman, have significant connections with the Government Chemical and Biological Warfare Centre at Porton Down Wiltshire. I had hoped to reach some kind of provisional conclusion about the most likely way Madeline died, but I find that I simply cannot. I've discussed several ways she might have died, but at present I don't think there is sufficient available evidence to rule any of those theories out. But I firmly believe that she died, that the death was unexpected, and the McCanns and others had a strong reason to cover up her death. Look at this possible clue from Rachel Oldfield, one of the Tapas Seven, published by the Daily Mirror on the 25th of April 2008, just before the one year anniversary. She was quoted as saying, if you take the common sense approach and look at timings and the fact that they are medics and there are four other medics in the group, they would know what to do to resuscitate a child. Who said anything about resuscitating a child? Where did that come from? Was it a Freudian slip? Perhaps I shouldn't use that word anymore. It immediately raises the possibility that Madeline had perhaps been rendered unconscious. But if that is what happened, it would line up with all of our scenarios. It would line up with an overdose of sedatives or drugs, an accident, or an attack by one of the parents, or maybe by a third party, so we are none the wiser. And another clue from Dr David Payne when he was asked by the police about whether the McCanns had a kit bag for their tennis gear, replied by first saying they certainly didn't have a great big tennis bag and then went on to say, but it certainly wasn't a big tennis, you know, things that you could put a tennis racket in. There was nothing of that size that you could hide a, a tennis racket in or anything like that. 
Is this a clue that Madeleine's body was carried in a tennis bag? But again, if it is, it still sheds no light on how she may have died. To my mind, there is one theme in this case that tends to dominate all others, and that is the truly vast scale of involvement of the government and its security arms such as MI5 and Special Branch in protecting and supporting the McCanns. I gave many details in my first Madeline film. Ten years on, this active government involvement continues. What might the government wish to cover up above all else? I suggest that they would be most worried if it emerged that senior politicians and members of the government, perhaps very high profile, were revealed to have been involved in very immoral and very illegal acts. High profile people who we think are autonomous might actually be being controlled directly because they have been trapped by security agencies carrying out child sexual abuse. If this was uncovered, it means these high-profile people can no longer hold office and the security service loses control of their carefully manufactured assets. As we've seen in recent years, this is probably just the tip of an iceberg with high-level politicians and celebrities being involved in paedophile rings. The McCanns brought paedophilia into their daughter's disappearance from day one. They went on to develop several news stories about paedophile gangs having stolen Madeline to order. It may be that the McCann's connection to the world of paedophiles is only slight, but even if they just had personal knowledge and proof of one very key person who was a paedophile, that might just be enough for a panic-stricken government to trigger the huge amount of support from British police and security services, government and media, who all seemed available at the drop of a hat to swing into action on the morning of Friday the 4th of May, and create such a powerful abduction scenario that 10 years on, most British people still believe it. I do not suggest that there is any evidence that Madeline was killed as the result of an attack by a paedophile. But then, like so many others, I am troubled by the Lolita photograph of Madeline. It's a very disturbing thought that an adult could make up Madeline in a highly sexualized way in order to make her available for a paedophile. As for the cause of death, I have taken you where I can, but have not been able to completely rule out any of the suggested causes. And here's where I need your help. If you have any knowledge or view or opinion on what may have happened, please email me. This may be my last scheduled film about Madeleine McCann, but if anything new and credible should emerge, be sure I will be telling you about it. Thanks very much for watching this series of films. Just one final point on why I made these films. I made them to show to the widest audience what mainstream media are really about. If you've watched my whole series, which now amounts to about 14 hours of documentary, please follow these links and watch a BBC documentary about the case and a BBC interview with Robert Murat. With the knowledge you have gained from my films, you can now watch this BBC propaganda in its true context and know fully what they are up to.